everyone and welcome to another Scott Swahey podcast and today I'm joined by Damien Barr, a writer, broadcaster and most importantly for today, host of BBC Scotland's Big Scottish Book Club which returns on Sunday the 25th of October. Hello Damien. Hi Alistair, thanks for having me. Oh absolute pleasure. And the first thing to say, I think, is congratulations, because this series is going to be eight episodes long as opposed to four previously, which says to me unmitigated success. You must be delighted by that. I, I am thrilled. I'm thrilled about it. I mean, I think when we did Big Scottish Book Club, the first series, um, you know, we were sort of testing the waters and the response on people has been phenomenal, I think, because especially during lockdown, more and more people have been uh, finally get into that big pile of books, the big TBR pile. Um, and I think, you know, our show features loads of Scottish writers and loads of book groups. Every episode's got a book group in. So I think, um, you know, the, the, the eight episodes sort of shows that there's a big appetite for books and stories. Well, absolutely. Um, and before we talk about the new series, I'd like to uh, ask you a little bit about the ideas and aims behind the series so when it began what was it kind of brought to you and well I mean I've been I've been you know doing events about books as a way of avoiding writing my own books for a very long time there's not it's a really good excuse for not doing any writing it's all I'm reading because I'm interviewing this brilliant writer so I've been doing my salon for uh, over 10 years now and um, all over the world and I interview writers and about their work and their process and their lives. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, the BBC uh, wanted to do, wanted to do a book show. And so it seemed like a natural, like quite a natural fit. Um, I think the thing that's, one of the things that makes this show different is that we have a theme every episode. So the themes in the series coming up are other worlds. So real and imagined, uh, history, class, Gallus is a theme. So um, I, I, we have a theme and each of our authors comes at it in a slightly different way. Um, and over that hour, we have a narrative, um, which is which is the great joy of it. I can't wait to see who you've got on for the Gallus show. That will be fascinating. Don't know if they're not told you. We've got no. really... oh, well, yeah. Wait and see. Okay. I think that's the best way for it to be. Um, so... There's an incredible, I have seen some of the names of the guests who are coming up on the series. Um, mm. Fantastic lineup. I, could you tell us a, a few of those names? Is that possible? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so we've got, I think it's really important to mix established names and emerging names. And that's nice for the writers as well. So they're not always on with the same people. And they're not always talking about new books because I can't bear that when somebody's sitting there punting their book at you or yeah. their telly program or whatever it is, which is exactly what I'm doing now, of course. <laughs> Um, but, you know, we, we've got people, you know, Gray, Neil Gaiman's on talking about the Graveyard book. And I think that book's been out for over, over 10 years, but he's in our Other Worlds episode. He drove down from Sky. So excited. He's like, I've not been out. I've not seen anybody. You know, where am I? I've seen more people in this room than I have in the last nine months. So, um, and we did a book group in Cumbernauld um, uh, for his book, which was brilliant. Um, so he's on there. Um, and in the same episode, we've got the very brilliant Kirsty Logan uh, talking about her collection of things we say in the dark. So um, really great, spooky, creepy short stories, um, which have been optioned uh, for telly as well. So she's there. Got Jamie Godley as well, talking oh. about her memoir, uh, Handstands in the Dark, and um, trying to get a word in entries for Jamie. <laughs> very fun. Um, but also, you know, getting having a real laugh, but also getting to their very sad emotional heart of her story um, about what happened to her growing up in Glasgow and the abuse she experienced and how she survived that and so and then a cracking time with Val McDermott and Sue Black bit of a double act that they mm -hmm. are um, talking that Sue's compelling non-fiction book about bones not something you think you'd say but I mean if you haven't read it you've absolutely got to read it she, she talks about the skull she talks about the long bones she talks about the secrets that our body holds in its bones so like you can tell if somebody was a vegetarian you can tell where they lived when they were born you know and um and she's very calm and and she is a source of information for Val so Val will phone her up and say I'm trying to kill somebody in my book um uh, if I broke this bone 
would they die? And so it'd be like, well, maybe not. If you broke it that way, if you broke this bone in this way with this implement. And so Sue is this incredible user for Scotland's crime writers, of which there are many. So Sue and Val together um, was absolutely great fun. And then Graham Armstrong. And um, this is a book that I just want everybody to read. The Young I Team. I have recently um, interviewed Graham myself and he's a fascinating oh. chap and it's a brilliant book. I mean, I really- Isn't it great? Yeah. I mean, I, what did you love about it? I thought the way his use of language was quite incredible mm. and it was mm. lyrical almost. And, you know, people say that mm. writing Scots um, a, or dialect uh, can be problematic and it can, mm. but mm. this just seemed to flow off the page. You, you, you mm. read it as you wrote it. It was almost like reading um, Anthony Burgess or Clockwork Orange or something. Once you got mm -hmm. the rhythm off it, it really came through. Mm. Yeah, um, it reminded it me perfect. actually um, of a number, it reminded me of Ulysses. Mm -hmm. It reminded me of Catch on the Rye, uh, and it reminded me of The Yellow Birds, um, which is a, 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 a war book by Kevin Powers, but I absolutely loved it. He grew up in Airdrie, I grew up just near Motherwell, you know, and I'm picking up this book and I'm reading somebody and he's saying Sahin and this and, you know, and cunt five times on the first page. I, I mean, it is, it is absolutely takes you right into this young team and these boys um, and he is, as you know, a compelling interviewee, but he also, it's just, it makes you, it's that thing that fiction does by being specific, it gets to a universal feeling. And anybody who has, you know, struggled to fit in or felt afraid for the future um, will, will, will identify with this. But the book group that we did it for is a group of women runners from Aloha Right. Um, and they were, they are not his target audience. And they were all like, well, you know, it's a lot of swearing. And, but actually, that they loved it. They absolutely loved it. I mean, they could not stop talking about how much they loved it. So we've got Graham Armstrong in there as well. Um, and yeah, and then, you know, Andrew Hagen. I'll just casually mention that. So we've got loads of fantastic um, Scottish writers and then writers from, you know, across the UK and around the world, Lem Sissy is on the show, Richard Osman is on the show, um, it's just Jojo Moyes is on the show. Do you have an input into um, who appears? Because to me, it seems like the dream job. It's a bit like, have, you know that uh, game, uh, if you had your perfect dinner party, who would you invite? It seems a little <laughs> bit like that to me. Um, yeah, you're not far off. I mean, obviously it's a, a team effort and I work really closely with the production company IWC and with BBC Scotland. Um, and it is the big Scottish book club, so we always want to make sure a range of Scottish voices are represented and sure. we have a poet in every episode. So, you know, we've got, um, uh, uh, oh my God, I'm trying to think of names, Heather H. Young in there, um, uh, Jeanette Iachi, you know, we've got kind of a real, Scotland's got an amazing poetry scene. Oh, amazing. Much better, it has to be said, than in England. And, um, and so we're really spoiled for choice there. So. I think, you know, when we're thinking about the next series and who we want to have on there, you know, we've got all these people that because of COVID and because of one thing or another, we couldn't get on this series. And so, you know, we're, we're, there's no shortage. And the nice thing about writers is, is that, you know, they keep writing um, so we can have people back. So, um, you know, if Janice Galloway is watching, Janice, hurry up and finish your book so we can have you back <laughs> on the show. Um, you no know, pressure, um, but um, yeah. So, so, so it's that's one of the big parts of it, kind of casting the show and thinking about how people, you know, maybe their books correspond. They over, you know, one person was influenced by another, um, or you know, they have something really interesting to say about the theme, and that's what I'm most. I, that's what I want. I really just I want a really lovely chat, um, yeah. and it just so happens, you know, as with you that like people are watching and listening, that's the joy of it. And you have, as you say, the, the book clubs, how do you think about marrying up the book clubs and the books? Because you just say, if the the female runners are looking at Graham Armstrong or come yeah. on looking at Neil Gaiman, it's an interesting yeah. way of putting these people together. Yeah, I mean, I don't do that. We have a brilliant producer called Nicholas who's be, who, who casts the book groups and lots of book groups get in touch um, and uh, want to be a part of it, which I think is lovely. 
Um, so sometimes it's, you know, it's, well, would you like the Graham and, you know, this group of runners, you know, would you expect them to, you wouldn't yeah. expect them to get on with the book, but they did. So it's unexpected. And then one, you know, that was maybe more expected, but really worked where they loved it was a group of celebrants. Mm -hmm. um, so people who do, you know, weddings and funerals yeah, yeah. and that sort of stuff. Absolutely. Three women. Um, I just wanted to hang out with them all day. I just felt so like Zen being with them. And they did Lem Sissy's memoir you know, and they were talking about the importance of storytelling, because that's what a celebrant does. They tell the story of somebody's life, yeah. you know, at critical moments, birth, marriage, death, whatever. And they were really interested in how Len had told the story and how he used his official records of having been adopted and uh, forcibly and, and all that. So, so yeah, the book groups are a really important part of the show, because I think I want to break down, you know, the stigma that still exists, I think, for some people, or the fear that exists for some people around reading. Um, everybody has got a story. Everybody's entitled to all the books. I tell you, there was a book group of men that I met called Book Who's Talking, and they did Mayflies by Andrew O'Hagan. Amazing right. book. Everybody needs to read it. And that, that's, that, that is a book about boys who are pals and growing up in Irvine in the 80s, and then it's the later part of their life in their 50s. This book group of like straight white men from Steps, and um, they it was this, this they were the characters from the book, and I sat there and I listened to them talking about their friendship over forty years, their lives, how books are a part of their lives, and these are the men were told don't read or are unreachable or are not interested, and I'm just like rubbish, you know, if, and particularly so in Scotland, I think you know there's a rich history of, of, of proper education accessible for working class people and for me the show is part that's that's why we have book groups in the show yeah um to show that books are for everybody i think um i don't know if you agree but i sometimes think that um because this show sticks out like a shining example of how books should be dealt with on television and oh, i sometimes you. think that broadcasters and maybe more generally people underestimate just how popular reading and books and talking about books is. Would you agree? Mm. Yeah, I think I, I mean well obviously we agree because we you know look yeah. behind you at your bookshelves, you know. <laughs> yes. I mean I don't I'm not I'm not at my bookshelves, but you know, you'd see yours are much tidier, by the way. But um I, I think that absolutely some of the book groups we spoke to, some people were like polygamous, they were in two or three different book groups, yeah. and other people were book group monogamous. So, you know, I, I think that particularly again during lockdown, more and more people um, are reconnecting with the love of story, whether that's watching Netflix or listening to podcasts or reading books or a combination. Um, and I, I think that this show gives people a space to talk about that. Um, and what's really great is when you look online, you see people then having conversations on Twitter or on Instagram about books that they've bought that they maybe wouldn't have bought um, because they watched the show. And that is the most satisfying yeah. thing. When somebody buys a book that, you know, who maybe wouldn't have bought a book or got it out of the library, because we work closely with the Scottish Library and Information Council to make sure that, that uh, libraries have all the books. Um, so yeah, that's the, that's the big win for me is when people continue the conversation um, in their, their own lives. Um, yeah. I think that's one of the lovely things is that you get to see the personalities of the writers instead of just being a name on a book like you know mm -hmm. Val McDermott sells loads but then you get to listen to it and you realize the character and the knowledge and all of those things and I think mm -hmm. that can be really appealing to people they're almost like oh well that's not for me and then they, they can relate to the person and then they perhaps relate to the book itself yeah I mean I think you I think you hit on something there that I've not thought about which is that you know when you see a name on the front of a book it's like you know, they're, they're, it's, not a, it's not a person. Um, and a lot of writers think, actually focus on the work, don't, don't think about me. But I think yeah. that the, the story of the writer is very often part of the story of the book, whether it's fiction or non-fiction. I've written memoir and I've written novels. And I can tell you there's just as much of me in my novel, if you know where to look, as there is in my memoir. It's just that in the memoir, I'm being upfront and saying, this is me. And in the novel, I'm like, well, it's about them. But it's about it's there's me in there as well so I think it's it's really important particularly obviously in memoir but it's important in fiction as well part of the reason for that uh, is um uh, Paul McVeigh talks about it in our episode about class he says if you can't see it you can't be it and I want people who are watching this show who feel not just that they're readers but they're writers to yeah. watch it and to understand that 
writers, you know, don't, like, it doesn't just happen overnight. It's a job. You sit down. You have to work up courage to do it. You have to work at it. You have to be supported to do it. Um, and that these are, you know, these are people who work as writers. And I want to break down the mystique, not the respect, because you can respect somebody while also understanding that they are a flawed human being. Uh, but just to make people think, well, actually, you know, even if I'm not going to publish it, I can write too, and I can have access to the joy and the benefits that the writing brings as well as reading. That's a lovely idea. If you can't see it, you can't be it. I think that's so yeah. true. Um, yeah. It touches on Alistair Gray's idea for imagining the city. Or, you know, it has to exist in the imagination as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, you touched on lockdown, and mm. I know this, the um, original series was before lockdown, but it does seem to me that this is almost the perfect show to view because people are looking for recommendations things to um maybe challenge them take their mind off things inspire mm. them in some ways um did you have that in mind with the second series that this would be the case no i have to say um we 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 were supposed to make this show back in the spring um lockdown happened i was on book tour in australia new zealand and finally in south africa which is where my novel is set and um, I got one of the last flights out of South Africa and got back to the UK. Um, and I then thought at that moment, well, we're all going to be locked down. We're all going to need stuff to do. So that's actually where the show Shelf Isolation came from, which I filmed at home with people in their homes. So you know, Alan Cumming, Kirsty Walk, Mark Bonner, all these, Denise Mina, all these great people. Um, and that was done at home and that was strange because there was no crew, there was no yeah. lights. It was just sort of me in my house having to kind of, you know, walk into the living room and decide it was lights, camera, action. It was really strange. And, um, but, 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 but I think that this show, now that we've, you know, managed to, to, to make it, um, uh, will hopefully give people inspiration and comfort um, during, during what is going to be a hard winter. Sure. Um, and, you know, if that means that people, you know, people can escape into, you know, into Neil Gaiman's graveyard or into Kate Mossy's 16th century France or, you know, into Kirsty Works, you know, Galloway, then I'm, I'm delighted. Absolutely. I mean, it's the perfect chance to explore those books that maybe you've been uh, putting off for a while, I think. Yeah, um, no, I've been doing it as well. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So have I, so have I. Um, from going back to the first series, do you have any highlights that you know really have stuck with you? Um, I think, oh god, there's, there's, there are lots, but um, one of the first first ones that comes to me is Graham Norton, um, who is often derided as a writer mainly by people who haven't read him, yeah, because um, they think, oh, how can he be funny and famous on the telly and then also write good books? But he is, he's a very, very classic Irish writer. And he focuses on that sort of Celtic Gothic, hidden stories, villages with secrets, twitching curtains. Um, and he, he writes incredibly well. He's always been a reader. He's always been a writer. And, and if he didn't have his name on the cover of his book, uh, I think, you know, uh, he, I mean, it's not that he gets bad reviews, but I just think people are cynical about it. So but I did say to him, you know, there were two things about your book um, that surprised me. First of all, that you wrote it, and second of all, it was good, and um, and that and that, that 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 remains true. So so that that you know that was that was um that was a really great moment. Um, I think it was. I loved. You know, we did. Um, uh, we talked about Hamnet, Maggie O'Farrell's book that just won mm -hmm. the Women's Prize, um, which was a great privilege. She gave us a wee sneak preview, world preview of that. Um, and that's an amazing book. She's a great writer. Um, and I also love talking to Janice Galway, again, mentioning Janice, who's sort of like the fairy godmother of Scottish literature, and um, talking to her about her memoirs, because they really inspired me to write mine. Right. And um, there's something about Janice that's seductive and compelling. And she's like this teacher that you want to please, even though she's not a teacher anymore. She's like this incredible teacher that you want to please. Um, and she... Uh, she understands writing at a technical level that I don't think I will ever get to. Um, but just to kind of bask in that brilliance for a wee while is great. So I love talking to Janice and she's funny as well. So, you know, so, so, so yeah, so I mean, I mean, to be honest, they're all highlights and that sounds cheesy, but, um, I, you know, 
I had I get to sit down and have conversations that I really want to have. Like with this show, I've wanted to interview Lem Sissy for years. I've wanted to interview Lem Sissy for years. And it's not managed to work. And finally I got to sit down and have that conversation with him and ask him all the questions that I've wanted to ask him for ages. So, you know, um that that was that was a joy for me. No, and there were people we wanted to get on that we couldn't get on. Like I really wanted Douglas Stewart to come on. I wanted to chat to him about Shuggy Bain, which is a book I've been shouting about oh, since I got yes. a proof. And um, it's, it's a smashing book and shortlisted for the book cup, which crossed. And, um, but you know, he, he couldn't get here um, um, from New York. So uh, series three. Yeah, exactly. And I can imagine as well, I, I would think, um, you know, going in each time you're, you're recording and thinking, I've got, you know, a new conversation with these people every single time. Yeah. Do you have yeah, a- it's exciting. A, do you have a fantasy guest though? I mean, either dead or alive that you thought, Oh, I wish oh, I could well, that is really good. Well, I mean, immediately Dolly Parton, who I've interviewed before for Radio 4, and um, who has a book out just now, and she is such a voracious reader and always has been. She's on a tour bus the whole time. She's nothing else to do but read. And so I interviewed her and I said, so, you know, what have you, what have you just read? And she said, I've just finished rereading Catcher in the Rye. It wasn't as good as the first time. You know, and I just love that, that that confounds people are like, oh, it's tits and hair and ha ha ha. But actually, it's a powerful businesswoman with an amazing understanding of narrative, all her stories, all her songs are stories. Oh, so it'd be great to have Dolly on the show. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Absolutely. It'd be great. Um, it'd be great to have Dolly on. And then people who are dead, um, I would love to have, oh, well, it's not, no, no. I'd love to have had Truman Capote. That would have been interesting. That would be very um, interesting. To ask him about, you know, other voices, other rooms, and, uh, and you know, the stuff that he did towards the end of his career. I think if Truman Capote was around now, he would be really good on Twitter. Um, but I'm not sure <laughs> how, how good he would be. He's perfect for Twitter. <laughs> Absolutely perfect. But I'm not sure, like, it, but that would distract him from his writing or not. So Truman, Truman Capote would be great. And I would have, I would, would have loved the chance to interview Tony Morrison. Oh, ah, yeah. Um, because reading Beloved changed my life. That novel of nobody, if you haven't read it, it's not very long, is it, Beloved? It's no, it's about a that. short, it's been a novella length, yeah. Oh, I mean, it's giving me shivers. Like, the what she does with language, it's like I'm sitting here looking at a keyboard. I see all the letters. I can, they're all, all these letters are available to me. Could I do what Toni Morrison does with these letters? Not in a million years. She takes them and she takes the language and she makes it new and strange. And it's a story about a ghost called Beloved who has come, comes back from the dead to haunt the mother who killed her. And it is just life-changing read. It, everything is different after you read Beloved. So I'd really like to talk to Tony Morrison, although I might just sort of sit there gibbering going up. <laughs> but that, that would be, who, what about you? Well, I've just reread uh, Nan Shepherd's The Living Mountain and the same thing. Right. Short book, incredible book, and like, every word counts and every phrase mm -hmm. counts and all the images mm -hmm. count. And I think mm -hmm. I would love to talk to, to Nan. She seemed like a very interesting uh, woman who really um, only came to prominence, certainly came to my attention um, mm -hmm. kind of in the 2000s, I think. Wasn't really that well known before that. I mean, she's been, how long has she been on the five pound note? Ooh, no, long. she's on the fiver and yeah. she's, Canon Gate have got this competition, haven't they? The Nan Shepherd Writing Prize. We, we do actually have an episode on the show, which is all about nature. Oh. Um, and um, we have Kathleen Jamie on there. And we have I mean, uh, Amanda Thompson, who's written the Scots Dictionary of Nature, which introduced me to lots of new Scots words that I didn't know. Uh, for example, timber breeks, which is timber trousers, which is coffin. Uh -huh. uh, totally <laughs> gothic, love it. Um, uh, and Luke Turner was on that show about nature. So I, I um, and we did talk about Nan Shepherd in the show, which is what made me think of it. So uh, yeah, she'd be an interesting one. I'd like to sit with Nan Shepherd with a wee hip flask on a long train journey and yeah. talk about what we see out the window. That would be that would be ideal. Yeah, absolutely. And um, finally, it is the Big Scottish Book Club. So, what's your favourite Big Scottish book? Oh. That's a really good question. Um, 
right now because I've just finished reading like loads of Scottish books they're, they're all sort of in my head the one that just burst into my head of course was Scabby Queen which I'd get yeah, to talk to Kirsten Innes about which is a terrific book and really reminded me of Muriel Sparks The Public Image um, which is a book that isn't read enough um, but which is terrific but as, as I've said Spark I'll, I'll go for She's, I mean, it's, it's in my top probably top five books of all time, but uh, I definitely would have to say The Planet of Mystery and Brody um, as a novella. Um, again, I did that at school, and the books that you do early on obviously have such a big impact on you, but but I've re I've reread it lots over the years. It's a book I know Ian Rankin is obsessed by as well, and I think it, it to me, you know, it's that Scottish idea of doubleness mm. of appearances and reality, and it's um, it's a book I just keep finding new things in. I mean, it's tiny; it's a pure scale of a book, but I just am like, okay, now it's a book about feminism. Now it's a book about fascism. Now it's a book about you know uh, Protestantism. You know, and and um, and I'll, I I think I'll always return to it. So it's not a big book, yeah. um, but it certainly is a Scottish book, and it's big in my life. Actually, Muriel Spark would be a hell of a guest to have on a show. Oh, show. my God. Why did I not think of Muriel Spark? She'd be absolutely... But depending on her mood, she could be, like, the best or the worst. <laughs> yeah. I'd quite like it if she was the worst, actually. <laughs> it would definitely be entertaining. And I think it's interesting what you say about books you read when you're younger, leaving an impression. I've just read mm. an interview in The Guardian with Carla Bruni, and she's got a lovely phrase which says, things that affect you in your teenage years are tattooed on you. I think that's mm -hmm. right, whether it's albums or whether it's books or whether things like that. Mm -hmm. And th those books, um, I think, like a uh, going back to read, you know, Catcher in the Rye again. I would imagine uh -huh. I read it in my teenage years, and I'm sure it would be a different mm -hmm. thing to read now. So it might be interesting. I, I did reread it. I reread it um, last year. I was doing my PhD, and I, I was writing about the Buildings Roman, and I reread it for that. And in fact, I actually reread my original copy I had as a teenager which had all my embarrassing notes in it. So it was things like where I'd underlined and written my new favourite word, which was ironic. Um, and so, um, Barry Alanis Morissette. And so, um, so I did, I did reread it. And, and of course it doesn't have the same emotional impact because you're not at the same emotional stage of your life, but it is still, you know, a great piece of literature. Yeah. Um, it just doesn't have the same punch that it did have because you're not the same person. And um, strangely, though, having said that, I did reread really The Colour of Purple, which is another book that I had at that stage of my life, and it still does. But I think maybe there's more personal reasons for why that um, uh, continues to speak to me in the way that it did. Yeah, I think that's interesting. Rereading stuff from your younger days is an interesting thing to do. Well, Damien, thanks so much for talking to me today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Absolute joy. And uh, loved it. it's been great. Series, which, uh, as you say, is Sunday, 25th of October. Um, I recommend everyone to go and, and view it. Thank you very much. My absolute pleasure. It's nice to see you. Um, and uh, hopefully, you know, we'll get you along to the next series. Oh, that would be smashing. Thank you. And uh, we'll be back soon with someone completely different. Cheers. Mm -hmm.